Good day, everybody. Welcome. Um, my name is Sandra Galea. I um, have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. And I am here hosting this conversation with uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot, who we'll introduce in a second, wearing my hat as the chair of the Rockefeller Boston University Commission on Determinants, Data, and Decision-Making. Just a quick uh, bit of background about the commission. So the commission was uh, started in 2019, early in 2019, with the idea of bringing together a group of people to think deeply about the intersection of the movements in big data, how that can inform and move forward the social determinants agenda, which is we'll talk with uh, Sir Michael Marmot, he was really one of the founders of, and how to do that in a way that it results in better decision making for health. Now, the reason I, I, I anchor when the commission started in 2019 is because, of course, we started that conversation and uh, among a group of us long before COVID had ever been something we had ever heard of. And then COVID um, hit and a lot of the conversations of the commission became particularly relevant in a time of COVID. Because of course, while COVID was a virus that uh, uh, affected all of us, we all realized um, very quickly that COVID was fundamentally about social determinants. That the the um, the intergroup differences in COVID, both intranationally and internationally, were driven by the conditions of people's lives, where they lived, how um, what their employment was, and their capacity to protect themselves from a new infectious disease. So COVID really sharpened a lot of the conversation. The uh, commission deliberated for about a year and a half, and it will now be releasing a report. The report will be released consistent with UN General Assembly coming up in two weeks' time, and there will be a uh, launch event for the report, which um, everybody here is invited to. The report involves um, a set of principles and recommendations that fundamentally are about bringing a sharper lens and bringing more effort towards using data resources and not just simply big digital data resources, but also qualitative data resources and all data available to us to characterize the social determinants that characterize all our lives within our countries and across the world. and to make a push, a concerted push worldwide for decisions at federal, state, local levels that take into account the social determinants as we're thinking about health. And uh, I would encourage you all to um, come to the launch of the, the, of the report in a couple of weeks and also to participate in these conversations that we are hosting with um, key thinkers around the world. And the idea is to really surface the principles and the perspectives of the commission to the end of encouraging us all to weave social determinants thinking in decision making. Now today we are having a conversation with Professor Sir Michael Marmot. So let me introduce Sir Michael Marmot. Um, professor Marmot is a professor of epidemiology at University College London and director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity. He also serves as advisor to the WHO Director General on Social Determinants of Health in the new WHO Division of Healthier Populations. Sir Michael Marmot has led research groups on health inequalities for 50 years. His leadership and impact on the field of social determinants is nothing short of remarkable. He chaired the 2015 Commission on Equity and Health Inequalities in the Americas and the 2005 Commission on Social Determinants of Health, which produced the groundbreaking 2008 report, Closing the Gap in a Generation. At the request of the British government, he conducted the strategic review of health inequalities in England post-2010, which published his report, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, in February 2010. This was followed by the European Review of Social Determinants of Health and the Health Divide for WHO Euro in 2014. And in 2020, Health Equity in England, Marmot Review 10 years on and Build Back Fair, the COVID-19 Marmot Review. For many of us who have been in the field of social determinants for, um, um, uh, for some time, uh, Sir Michael Marmot has really been probably the single um, most um, important inspirational figure in helping both galvanize the science of social determinants, but I think making a um, strong, compelling moral case for the role that social determinants has to play if we are interested in health. So Sir Michael, it's really a privilege and an honor to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. So my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Let, let, me, let me start with, um, with uh, going back sort of uh, to your work, if I may, and I'll start by going back to your, um, you know, what, I, what I consider to be the sort of the foundational, the, like the Rosetta Stone for social determinants, which is your 2008 report, uh, Closing the Gap in a Generation. Can you talk us a little bit through where you think we were at before your report, before 2008, and where we are at now in terms of thinking about social determinants. How do you see the before the report and after the report? What progress have we made and, and, and what, where have we not made progress you would have liked us to make progress? Well, 
when we were doing the uh, WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, we had meetings in 10 countries. And I remember particularly uh, one meeting in Japan and uh, a senior global health figure from Japan said, uh, global health was initially about disease control. And now we know in addition to disease control, it should be about primary health care. And that was it. It said, we at the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, you've invited us to your country. Have you forgotten there might be something else? So there were these two fundamental streams in global health, disease control, malaria, tuberculosis, waterborne diseases, and so on. And then they discovered primary health care, great, big advance. What about social determinants of health? It wasn't on the global map. And indeed, when we convened the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, people said, what? What's social determinants? What sort of name is that? Um, how are you ever going to appeal to anybody with a name like that, social determinants of health? There was another stream around, which is the relation between health and economics. And there had been a WHO commission on macroeconomics and health. And that commission said, reflecting a dominant viewpoint within economics, what we need to do is to control diseases tuberculosis, HIV, malaria, in order to get economic growth. And at the time I was doing a fellowship at Trinity College, Cambridge, where Amartya Sen was the master. And over at high table at Trinity, as one does, I said, Amartya, don't you think the Commission on Macroeconomics and Health got it upside down? Surely we don't want to control diseases to get economic growth. We want to improve society in order to get better health, address social and economic circumstances in order to get better health. And Amartya said, I agree with you. I said, why don't we get a group together to say that? And then Amartya said, it might be good to get WHO backing. So I went to WHO, uh, to the Director General, J.W. Lee, said, how about setting up a commission on social determinants of health? He said, yes. Oh, wow, that was good. And that's what we did. Um, and people within WHO at first were a bit threatened. They said, we're disease control experts, and you're going to talk about education and the economy and working conditions and environmental issues. That's not really what we do. We're disease control specialists. So we had a lot of work to bring people on board. And, and, and where are people at now? So, where, so, 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 so fast forward 13 years. Well, David Satcher, who was um, a member of the commission, he says, and I'm quoting David, uh, he says that until the WHO Commission reported, the language of social determinants of, of health was not in evidence in the United States. It was actually the WHO Commission that brought the language to the US, David says to me. Now it's all over the US. Um, in the wake of the WHO Commission, I was invited by the British government, as you said in your introduction, to answer the question, how could we apply the recommendations, findings of the WHO Commission to one rich country, England, and produced fair society, healthy lives? The European region of WHO said to me, will you do a commission for us? And I said, well, I've done it globally and I've done it for England, why would I want to do it for a region? And they said, because it puts it on the agenda. So we did the European Review of Social Determinants of the Health Debate, and then the American region of WHO, the Pan-American Health Organization, said, would you do it for us? 
So we did equity in health inequalities in the Americas. And then the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO said, how about doing it for us? I said, I can't possibly, why not? Too busy and I know nothing about your region. And they said, it's an equity issue. You did it for Euro, you did it for <laughs> the Americas, you have to do it for us. So we did the Commission on Social Determinants of Health in the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO, North Africa and the Middle East. I can see evidence all over globally that people are taking this seriously in the Western Pacific region of WHO, in countries, in cities, in regions. Uh, we're on the agenda. Well, let me, I, I, I couldn't agree more that, that uh, social terms are now on the agenda. So let me, let me break up into two groups. Let me talk about governments and then private sector for a second. Let's start with governments. C can you um, talk us through how we can help governments deal with the other pocket problem, which is, of course, a problem that happens in all countries where, where the, you can have people, good people in government who understand that housing can improve health, but the people controlling the housing budget, of course, health is not really in their budget stream and people in health, housing is not in their budget stream. And um, the more I talk to colleagues who are you know, good people in good places all over the world trying to do the right thing in government, this keeps, this keeps hindering progress and at least in people's minds. I'm just wondering how you have tackled that and how you have helped organize people's thoughts around that. Well, the there's the issue that you've just referred to, which is what one might call turf. It's not my turf, or this is my turf. Health is your turf, and housing's my turf. And you look after health, and I'll look after housing, and we don't need to talk to each other. So that's very common. But there's another issue, which is, let's look at um, two important English-speaking countries, the United States and the United Kingdom, we've had a particular model of government that really started with Reagan and Thatcher uh, in the 1980s. And there's an argument, take the US, that the Roosevelt era, which started in the 30s, lasted for about 50 years, till 1980. And then the Reagan era um, lasted for another 40 years. And it's time for a rethink. It's a big question of whether the Biden uh, presidency signals that rethink, but uh, recognizing again, the role of the state, that the primacy of markets is not enough. Um, I don't want to get into the issue, but capitalism has been a pretty good system for delivering economic growth and prosperity, but it has its problems. And addressing those problems uh, is fundamental. Uh, ensuring that the benefits are equitably distributed is fundamental. And that was, was not a priority of governments uh, in the US and the UK from the 1980s on. Whereas it needs to be. So we've got the problem that you referred to of sectors, silos, not talking to each other. But then we've got the conceptual problem of a belief in markets, in small states, of uh, unbridled inequality, set the wealth producers free, all of these cliches that we've heard. Um, which are not, I mean, the evidence shows they're not good for health. You can run capitalist economies in a good way where health improves and inequalities get less, or you can run them in a way where health doesn't improve and inequalities get worse. And it's difficult to address that at national level. And sometimes, so how do I address it? I work with the levels where we get take up. And in Britain, for example, there's real enthusiasm at city and regional government, as there is in the United States. There are cities all over the US who are actively trying to promote action on social determinants of health and health equity. Whereas the federal government until now has 
not had it as a priority. What I've tried to do, and we have some success, is trying to make health equity a corporate issue for the whole of government. Defence is a corporate issue for the whole of government. The economy tends to be a corporate issue for the whole of government. And we should try and make health equity, the fair distribution of health and well-being, an issue for the whole of government. So precisely to take your example, we know if housing and education and environment are improving because health and health equity are improving. So that's the kind of model. Uh, and yeah, to a greater or lesser extent, we're seeing progress. Yeah, no, I, I actually very much appreciate your, your labeling the progress, but I also think we're seeing progress. So let me talk about another sector where I see progress, which is in the private sector. So in the American context, there is, it feels like over the past couple of years, there has been this some um, explosion of interest in the concept of social determinants in, uh, in, in, in the private sector. And, um, and I've had endless conversations with, with colleagues in the private sector who say, well, what, what do I do? I'm in, I'm in the C-suite in, in a particular company. And uh, what can I do about social determinants of health? So I'm actually wondering how you've addressed it. How have you addressed those conversations? Well, um, I envy you. I haven't had so many conversations with the private sector. I think it's important. I've been saying since we did the WHO Commission that the private sector produces products that can be good for health or bad for health. It employs people and employment patterns can be good for health or bad for health. And it has an impact on the wider environment, which can be good for health or bad for health. So the private sector is absolutely vital here. And I've been saying that and had a few desultory approaches. And then quite recently, one of the largest financial institutions in Britain, legal and general, that has a background as an insurance company, um, it has 1.3 trillion pounds of assets under investment. So it's not trivial, um, 1.3 trillion pounds, that's even more dollars, um, it's well, not trivial. And they approached us and said they would like to work with us. How was their question? Can we shift the dial? on health inequalities. What can we do both as a corporation, um, how we treat our employees, etc. Second, what can we do in terms of our investments um, that would improve health equity? And third, um, how can we use our charitable um, investment, our charitable funds uh, to improve health equity. That's pretty exciting. So we literally just kicked off um, a meeting. The chief executive of uh, uh, a program of work, the chief executive, it turns out he is a working class boy from the north of England. So he's very sympathetic to what we talk about. He's very sympathetic. He knows this background. Uh, he became the chief executive of this large, very successful corporation through his own brilliance. But he recognizes that most people can't do what he did and wants to ask the question, how could they improve the lives of people growing up in the north of the country, the deprived uh, Tyneside, Newcastle, north of Tyne region, uh, and improve the lives of people in regions like that. And this is exciting because his ambition, if this is successful, is that it shouldn't involve only his corporation, but he wants to bring other private sector organizations to the table as well. This is new for us, it's exciting, and I would say watch this space. Excellent. Let me let me shift back a little bit and, and go global for a second. And uh, let's talk a little bit about um, high income country and low mid and low middle income countries, recognizing that uh, those th those big buckets are, are are grossly oversimplifying. But labeling that for a second, 
Because the social determinist movement that as, as it's coalesced in the past uh, quarter century, and you've been at the heart of helping that coalesce, has been sort of high income country driven. So can, can you talk a little bit about the, the differences in the evolution of social determinist thinking in high income countries versus low middle income countries? And where you think particularly the, the conversation is at in low middle income countries? Low middle income countries understood this. They, they didn't need me to chair commissions to do this. They know, they know that living in grinding poverty is bad for health. Everybody knows that. Um, I think where we've brought something relatively new to the thinking is the idea, I mean, firstly, as we know, even in low-income countries, non-communicable diseases are about half and half with communicable disease. I'm talking pre-COVID now. And in middle-income countries, overwhelmingly non-communicable diseases are the major causes of death. So the understanding of social determinants of health in relation to lack of shelter, lack of nutrition, lack of sanitation, it's got to change when we're talking about cardiovascular disease and cancer. Um, the same social determinants that I just mentioned don't apply to cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, they're different. So that's the first thing. And secondly, mental illness, um, major issue. And what we've tried to get away from is a implicit hierarchy of needs of saying, well, we'll worry about self-actualization and mental well-being after we've got clean water and, and enough nutrition. We have to do them at the same time. People who are living in dire poverty uh, have the same rights, should have the same rights to mental well-being as people in high-income countries. Uh, we need to address these at the same time. And that's been relatively fresh as a way forward. The big issue, and I know it's a concern of yours, Sandro, a big issue is the lack of data. So the understanding is there, but the data aren't. I mean, for example, in our Eastern Mediterranean region commission, one of our commissioners had done a good study on Jordan. Um, the country of Jordan on what had happened. No data on inequalities in adult health. There are data on inequalities in child health, but no data on inequalities in adult health. And when I reported as an example on the work we'd done on the impact of the pandemic on inequalities in England and how it exactly as you said in the introduction, it played on and amplified pre-existing inequalities. And I showed that there'd been regressive changes to economic and social policy. For example, expenditure by local government went down more, the more deprived the area, entirely regressive. And my commissioners, my fellow commissioners were holding their head in their hands saying, we don't have these data. We, we know it's a problem, but we don't have the data, not the data on social determinants of health and not the data, particularly on adult health, disaggregated by some measure of socioeconomic position. So the understanding is there, but the evidence of how social determinants operate to cause health inequities is entirely lacking. Well, you anticipated my next question because it was going to be about data. So th th that's actually a perfect lead in. Can you um, reflect a little bit on um, data priorities as you see them? And in, 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 obviously you've already talked about fundamentally having the data to characterize inequities in, so in uh, low-income countries. Let's talk about high-income countries for a second. What, uh, in, 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 I mean, you've spent so much time in your own science and scholarship living in the world of data. And that, of course, led to a lot of your, uh, uh, a lot of your sharpening these ideas for all of us. Can you comment a little bit about where you see the data gaps and, and as a result, the data priorities in high-income countries? 
Well, in high-income countries, we're doing pretty well. Um, in Britain particularly, but in Europe, in the United States, in Canada, uh, we're doing pretty well with the data. Uh, we need to collect it systematically. Um, I'm delighted with the performance of our Office for National Statistics in Britain during the pandemic, um, getting good data on inequalities in the impact of COVID. Uh, we've got good data on the increased educational divide caused by lockdown on what's happened to the distribution of income and wealth. We've got good data. Um, it's really uh, encouraging and we're able to make sense of it, but this is limited to a few high income countries. Uh, it's not generally available. So I've been working with the Italian government and their data, not quite as rich as the data from the UK, but pretty good. They can do a pretty credible job in Italy of looking at social determinants of health and health disparities right across uh, Italy. So um, you can make progress. You can have a conversation. Why are the inequalities in health in the North similar to those in the South? But mortality is at a higher level in the South because we've got the data. We can have that conversation. And we know where the gaps are and what we need. And we've got a conceptual framework that guides it. We just can't have that conversation at that level in middle income countries, let alone low income countries. Let, let's change tack for a second and talk about COVID. You actually mentioned COVID in, in uh, your last answer, and I wanted to turn to COVID. So perhaps a, a, a controversial premise, or perhaps not, COVID hits. It's a brand new, brand new pandemic. But many of us wrote that COVID was going to result in deepening of health divides. And yet it still happened. Yet it still happened. So I'm just wondering how, where your thinking is at on this. How do we reconcile your optimism and my optimism? I say I share your optimism, actually, with the fact that when faced with the COVID test, I, I think I would give us as a world a, a, a C minus at best because we, and we saw the problems based on what we knew and we seemed helpless to stop them, to stop COVID from resulting in widening and deepening of health haves, health have nots, health divides. I'm just wondering your reflections on that and, and what that tells us about the robustness of our successes. One of the things I should have said in relation to your earlier question about uh, the take up of our ideas on social determinants of health, I could bore you, but I won't, with the number of different kinds of organizations that want to hear about this. Um, transplant surgeons in Italy, uh, oral uh, health dentists, uh, endocrinologists, reproductive specialists, mental health, and so on. It's just remarkable. And I was giving a lecture to um, dentists, an oral health conference, and I put up two slides without labels of the social gradient. And then I gave them the labels. Uh, one was um, the, the social gradient in oral health, decayed, missing, and filled teeth. And the other was COVID-19 mortality. They look identical by deprivation. They look identical. If you look at these two graphs, you wouldn't know which was COVID-19 mortality and which was oral health. <laughs> wow. Now, dentists know the cause of caries. It's sugar and, you know, the diet and lack of oral hygiene. They know the cause. And we know the cause of COVID. It's this rotten virus. Why, for these two very disparate conditions, do we get the social, same social gradient? The more deprived the area in which you live, the higher the mortality from COVID, and the worse the oral health. Identical. You could distinguish the two just looking at them. Now, that really should give us pause. Why, in the United States, are you failing to control COVID? It's become a political disease. 
hasn't it? It's become a political disease in the US. If you voted for one party, you get vaccinated. And if you voted for a different party, you don't get vaccinated. This is remarkable. This is absolutely remarkable. Um, in other words, the real determinants of political and social. I did a review of Jeremy Farrer's book on COVID for the Financial Times. I do odd things. So Jeremy Farrer is the director of the Wellcome Trust. Uh, he's a very famous communicable disease expert. He's been very much involved in the whole COVID response in Britain, particularly. Uh, it was a terrific book. I gave it a very positive review. He didn't talk about inequalities at all. Now, I didn't mark him down for that, um, but he was talking about control of the virus. And we did a terrible job in Britain of controlling. So you need these technical measures. And you did a terrible job in the United States um, of controlling the virus. What I've been writing about is we've done a terrible job of addressing inequalities. And you need to do both of those. You need to do the technical stuff and controlling the virus, lockdown at the appropriate time, social distancing, rolling out of the vaccines, and so on, protecting children in school. You need to do all of these important technical issues and take government political action at the right time. But you also need to address inequalities. And we've done a terrible job on both of those. Let me, let me uh, shift to some, a couple of questions from, uh, from the audience. We'll start with one um, it's a different topic, but I think it's actually an interesting question. Can you, do you think that the current universal healthcare agenda that WHO is, obviously it's a priority for WHO, does it undermine the importance of social determinants agenda to some extent? It only undermines it if you focus on that and forget social determinants of health. There have been moves at times which I've resisted strongly to roll social determinants of health into universal health coverage. And I've resisted strongly because it's a way of rolling it under the carpet, of forgetting it, of not addressing it. You can't just address social determinants of health within the context of the healthcare system. And yes, you can use the language and say the healthcare system is anything that impacts on health. But in practice, it means healthcare services. That's what it means in practice. So we need universal health coverage and we need social determinants of health. They're not the same thing. Don't pretend they are. Uh, we need them both at the same time. So I don't think universal health coverage conceptually undermines social determinants of health. It only does potentially politically uh, if you say, well, we're going to focus on UHC and forget social determinants of health. Um, then it does undermine it. But I've always been careful um, to say we need action on social determinants of health. But I've never said, stop spending money on health care. Well, I might say that in the United States because <laughs> you waste such a ridiculous amount of money on health care. So I might say that in the US, but I've never said it in other countries. Um, we need universal health coverage and we need action on social determinants of health. That's a terrific answer, thank you. Um, a separate question. This one is, is, is framed as a question about India, but I think it actually has a global um, implication. So the question is, um, what advice would you have to governance systems that are interested in equity around issues of intersectionality? And, and the questioner mentions gender, class, caste, and delivering equitable health around people of multiple intersecting groups, many of which bring disadvantage. It, this is such an important question globally. It's such an important question. And we're all, I would say, still wrestling with it um, all over the world, in every country. We're still wrestling with it. So one stream of thought is, you know what you need to do? You need to address social and economic inequalities. And that's the best thing you can do to address racial ethnic differences. Because to the extent that people uh, in minority ethnic groups are socially and economically disadvantaged 
by addressing social and economic inequalities, you address racial ethnic disadvantage. That's one stream of thought. An entirely different stream of thought is no, you can't simply understand um, racial ethnic differences on socioeconomic grounds. There is real structural racism and simply addressing the socioeconomic inequalities doesn't address structural racism. That's an entirely different stream of thought. And we're all wrestling with this. We're all wrestling with it. Uh, that uh, we need to address racism everywhere that it occurs. And if it's structural, not simply instances of individual discrimination, uh, they need to be addressed. And if the question from India was thinking about caste, absolutely fundamental. Um, but in India, for example, the rural health guarantee, um, if helping poor people um, with health care, with employment, actually reduces the inequalities associated with caste, that's a good thing. But if it doesn't fully address it, then you have to address the caste differentials explicitly. So, as I say, it's a terribly important question. None of us has the right answer right now, um, but there are different streams of thought and we have to bring them together. Let me ask another question, separate question, also from India. I'm actually delighted to have so many colleagues from uh, Asia joining us. The, just for everybody listening, we've been scheduling these conversations at different times of day, specifically for time zones. And it's a different question. And the questionnaire says, we're struggling with data. We're struggling with data to characterize the health inequities. And uh, so we're struggling with the health management information system. And other than this health data, they have mostly national family health survey, but really no other population-based samples. So how, what's your advice um, on addressing these issues in a country like India, in, a, in an emerging economy like India, where it's falling behind on, on having sufficient data to measure what needs to be measured in order to address it at the decision-making level? Well, my approach to this is rather than trying coming along with a, another measurement framework and saying, here we are, we've got the conceptual framework of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, and now you need a measurement framework to go along with it. Say, look, most countries have signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals, to the SDGs. Something like 11 of the 17 SDGs I would think of as social determinants of health. So if you've signed up to the SDGs, then what you need to do is put in place measurement frameworks to address them. And the key issue is being able to disaggregate your measures by some relevant stratification, socioeconomic, ethnic, geographic, uh, the relevant stratification. But uh, don't just pay lip service to measurement of the SDGs, do it. Put in place measurement frameworks. And so my advice is work hard to do this. And in a country like India, it may be too difficult to do it at the national level all at once, okay? Let's get good examples at the state level or even at the city and regional level. Show it can be done. Be a model of good practice and show what can be done. Excellent. Let me, it's a separate question. This one comes from the US, but um, it builds a little bit on the last point. Earlier, you mentioned that um, in some countries, and I think you're referring to the US and specifically, but I think it applies more broadly, the federal government has been having a really hard time in tackling some of these issues, but there has been some really interesting efforts at state or local levels. So the question is, um, can you comment on a couple of your favorite, doesn't matter from any countries, the municipal or state level efforts to uh, improve health equity and what lessons might we learn from them? Well, so let me start with my own country where the, the, I know well. Um, on the 30th of June, the front page of the Guardian newspaper, I sent it to a friend in the US, had two stories. The big one was England 2, Germany 0. It was and a big the story. Slightly, the slightly smaller one was jaw-dropping 
fall in life expectancy. My American friend, he said both of those stories were jaw-dropping, England to Germany nil. And so the second story, I had nothing to do with the first one, was my cliche when I was describing the fall in life expectancy in Greater Manchester in the Northwest region of England of 1.6 years for men and 1.2 years for women in 2020, jaw-dropping, wow. Now the mayor of Greater Manchester, so Greater Manchester is 10 cities, um, is about the same population as Wales, 2.8 million or 3 million people. Um, and the, the mayor of Greater Manchester, who had been the health minister, the secretary of state for health, when I produced the Marmot Review in 2010. So he was very sensitized to these issues and he invited me to work with them. And then COVID happened. So we called our report, Build Back Fairer in Greater Manchester. And every sector in Greater Manchester is committed. They're committed, social services, education, transport, um, the employment sector, uh, they're all committed. Now it's difficult because they're working in a national context, but they're really committed. It was so inspiring working with these people um, because it comes back to your earlier question about how do you get the different sectors to work together. At that scale, you can get them to work together. The Minister of Housing at at Greater Manchester level or City of Manchester sits in the next office to the person in charge of education who sits in the next, I mean, they only have to walk out of their office and they're talking to each other and they, they belong to, you know, they sit in meetings, they're talking to each other. Um, so it, it, it's a scale issue. I mean, I remember the first time I had met anybody from government in Wales I was sitting in the Minister of Health's office in Wales, in Cardiff, and he said, my colleague, the Minister of Social Justice needs to hear this. And he picks up the telephone. And then he said, in fact, the Minister of Finance needs to hear this too. And five minutes later, I've got three ministers sitting around the table. I thought to do that in Westminster, the seat of the UK government, that would take three weeks to organize such a meeting, not five minutes. So at city and regional government level, you can do that because of the scale. So it's really exciting. Coventry in Britain, the city of Coventry in 2010, after my Marmot review, declared itself a Marmot city. They said, we are a Marmot city. We're going to take your six domains of recommendations. We're going to do them at city level. And how did and, they do? Well, we did, we've had a look at it. And the first thing is there's no control. So this is not a yeah. neat experiment where you can say, ah, you know, you've got a controlled experiment. So it's not a neat control, but what they did the percent of children age five with a good level of development went up. The proportion of young people age 18 to 24, not in employment, educational training, neat, the proportion went down. The proportion of people earning a minimum wage went up. So there were indicators moving in the right direction. As I said, it's not a pucker experiment. You can't say, well, they proved that they could do it. But the indicators look good. They look like they're moving in the right direction. And they're so enthusiastic. They contacted me and said, we want to renew our commitment to Samarmot City. Is that OK with you? Is it OK? I'm delighted. Um, so they're pretty enthusiastic. They think they're doing a good job. And the indicators would tend to support them. That's wonderful, actually. That's, that's, a really, that's really terrific to hear. Uh, this is a question from Mexico about uh, the um, 
sustainable development goals? And, and uh, how do you see the SDGs with, in, in regard to social determinants? And uh, the questioner says, there's a lot of health, health equities baked into a lot of the SDGs, which of course aligns them with uh, a lot of what you've written and spoken about. Uh, but um, how do you see the SDGs focus with respect to dealing then with these uh, other sectors that one must deal with to improve health? Well, as I said earlier, something like 11 of the 17 SDGs, I would label as social determinants of health. So only number three is explicitly health, but reducing poverty, reducing inequality, gender equity, reducing hunger, uh, and so on. These are all vitally important, and they are social determinants of health. Once you've got conceptually that idea, now, I, if I could have waved a magic wand and um, achieved my wish, my fantasy, I would have made health equity the outcome of the SDGs. I would have said the way we're really making progress, uh, we know we're really making progress, is if health equity is improving. Um, so we want to make progress on all of the goals and the outcome should be health equity. So that would be my approach to it. But the SDGs, and as I said earlier, it's vital to have them disaggregated. So not just having averages uh, for a country or a state within a country, but having them disaggregated by some relevant measure of inequity, whether it's racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, urban, rural, or the like. We're, uh, we're nearing time, so I, I want to conclude with two questions and uh, that are sort of more um, perhaps looking back, looking forward. And I'll, I'll start with a, perhaps a bit more of a personal question. So we tend to have a lot of students who join these uh, calls. So I think it's important to ask you to reflect a little bit on, on your professional path and, uh, and, and, and um, how you look back at, uh, I sort of feel like you have students who have been inspired by you, motivated by you, and who've chosen paths based on hearing you speak. But how do you get to be you? Because I think that, that, that that's the question that many students want to know. And, uh, and I often feel, if I may, that sometimes your enormous contributions to population health science quantitatively are often lost because of your contributions in, uh, in, in the realm in the past 20 years of advocacy. So I was wondering if you can comment on all of that and weave that for our student listeners who are looking at shaping their life trajectory. Well, and particularly for the student listeners, I would invite them to read my introduction to my book, The Health Gap, uh, where I talk a bit about my journey uh, from a young doctor concerned with um, the conditions that led people to get sick. Through my scientific journey, uh, and I, I knew I always wanted to do science, uh, I mean, to do research. And believe me, I published a lot of papers. Um, so I knew I always wanted to do, to do research, but my experience, even as a medical student and a young doctor was, uh, helped me choose what I wanted to do, to do research on. Um, initially, it was a practical question was, why do we keep um, patching people up and then sending them home and then seeing the same patients come back again with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or cardiac failure and the like. Shouldn't we be doing something about preventing uh, the, uh, these diseases? But then more generally, recognizing that the conditions in which people live were impacting on their disease. And my goodness, you could actually do research on that topic. And so curiosity driven research, but always tinged, always tinged with the social purpose of this curiosity driven research. The social purpose meaning, ideally, how would the results of our research help change things for the better? And that was very much what drove me. And it wasn't quite one day, but almost one day, I thought, what if people took our research seriously? What if they took research seriously? 
And then I described my conversation with Amartya Sen. And then I thought, what if we took it seriously? Maybe I should actually try and work a bit harder to get people to act on the research findings. And I would argue that what I've done, as you said, in my advocacy is always been based on the evidence, based on the research. You asked me a few moments about, about a few moments ago about Coventry, did it work? And I was, I think, suitably modest by saying, uh, I don't really know, we don't have a controlled experiment, I'd really like the data, but the indicators were moving in the right direction. Um, that's good, but not as good as I would really like it. I really want the evidence because the stuff we do with good intentions doesn't always work. Uh, being a nice fellow isn't good enough. Um, you've got to be a nice fellow and produce good results. So the evidence is absolutely crucial. So I've never lost that respect for the data, that respect for the evidence. Uh, it influences everything we do. But what's grown over time and it's got bigger, in my case, bigger as I've got older, which is the commitment to social justice, to fairness, to equity. Um, and rather than getting more conservative, I'm getting more angry and more impassioned as I get older. Hey, we've got evidence. We need to act on that evidence. And you know when we need to do it? Right now. The uh, as soon as, that's a terrific answer. As soon as I asked you this question, a couple of uh, folks sent in questions. Uh, what advice? What advice do you have for our junior colleagues? Oh my goodness! I've always resisted when people ask me for advice to <laughs> young people. I say I tried advising my own children, and that got me nowhere. So why would I offer advice to anybody else's? Um, but what I would say, so don't take my advice. That's my first advice. Uh, don't take anybody's advice. But what I would say is the two things that motivate me, which I've just mentioned. One is it's an absolute privilege to get up every morning and knowing you're working on health equity, whatever form that takes whether you're a doctor at the front line, if you're a public health person, a researcher, whatever form that takes, what a privilege. It just, what meaning it gives, what purpose it gives to your activities. And there are very few of us in work who can say that about the work we do, that it's infused with a social purpose and a meaning, which is an absolute privilege and a reward. And the second, is the absolutely vital importance of data and evidence. As I said before, good intentions are necessary, but not sufficient. We need the evidence too. Well, that perhaps um, if you can do something like that, be motivated by social justice and equity and act on the evidence. And it may be you're somebody who will collect the evidence uh, you'll be involved in the research and the data analysis, or you will act on the evidence that's around. But they seem to me to be good, two good rules. That strikes me as, a, as very good advice indeed. Let me end on an um, envisioned future question. I think it's appropriate to look forward and uh, to ask you to build on your extraordinary journey in, this, um, in the social determinants world and look 25 years ahead. And um, where, where do you want the world to be? Where do you want the world to be in, uh, at the intersection of issues, social determinants and health equity 25 years from now? Well, I'm glad you asked the question of where do I want it to be, not where do I think it will be? Because where do I think it will be? I haven't a clue. What I do know is most people's predictions are wrong and my predictions will be no better than anybody else's. Where I want it to be, is to deal with the two major questions of our time, the climate crisis and inequality. They are the two major questions of our time. 
the climate crisis and inequality, global inequalities as well as national inequalities. And I want us to be dealing with those two major questions at the same time. If we're not careful, we will take action on the climate crisis that increases inequalities. Do we really want to do that? I would hope not. But, you know, carbon trading, we can, we can buy our way out of trouble in rich countries, um, which will make things worse in poor countries. Whew, that doesn't sound like a good model um, at all. So I think we need to deal with them at the same time. So where I want us to be is, I mean, look at Europe in the 20th century. If you'd asked me this question in 1900, um, God, two world wars, um, totalitarian regimes, uh, fascism, communism, ghastly. Um, that Holocaust, genocide, ghastly. And then Europe in the second half of the 20th century arguably had the best conditions for human existence ever um, with the rise of liberal democracies, respect for human rights, uh, in, at least in the 1950s and 60s, relatively narrow inequalities, improved environment and so on. So we can get these massive changes. What we don't want is that the 21st century will look like the 20th. Uh, we want to get to where we got in the 1960s uh, without going through what we went through in the two great wars, the Great War and the, the Second World War. Uh, and so we want to do it in a spirit of social justice, equity, fairness, and dealing with the cr climate crisis at the same time. Well, this strikes me as a, as a good envisioned future and, uh, and a really excellent aspiration for all of us. Sir Michael Marmot, thank you very much for spending time with us. And thank you to our audience for uh, engaging. And really, thank you for everything you're doing. My pleasure. Thank you. Everybody, good afternoon, good evening, and uh, good morning wherever you are in the world. Have a great day.